Hi everyone, it's Lewis here from GCSE Physics Online and I really do hope that your revision is going well as you're preparing for any exams that you might have this summer. Now I met with some of the people at OCR which is one of the big exam boards and they gave me this rather nice document and um, it's something unfortunately I can't find a link to it so if anybody does find the link to this document please post it in the comments beneath this video. Now this has basically been produced um, and it's distilled uh, a lot of information. Now every year there are thousands and thousands of people doing exams and the people who mark these exams and the examiners, they often see that there's certain mistakes that lots of people tend to make. And what they've done is this one here is for GCSE science, both A and B for OCR, but I can guarantee that a lot of the mistakes that they see for OCR are going to be the same for Edexcel, for AQA, for WJEC. Whichever exam board you're doing, these are the common mistakes. So although you might not be doing OCR exams this year, it's still worth watching this video as I go through some of the biggest mistakes that people make and therefore they lose easy marks. Now a lot of these mistakes seem really obvious. So there's things that you think you're not going to be doing this, but this is what they found. They found that uh, you need to make sure that your final answer is clear. And what you don't need to be doing is scribbling out your final answer so that your, end, your page ends up looking like this. Okay, they can see that if you put a small line through any wrong answers, they can see that's not your, the final answer, and then just write your correct answer to the side. If you don't make your answers clear, it's gonna be very hard for the people marking your work to see exactly how much you do know. Remember that people who do mark exams, they're seeing hundreds and hundreds of questions. They don't have time to be looking, um, you know, kind of around the page, trying to find a very small answer that you've put in there. Make your answer really clear and it can guarantee that you've got the right marks. Now, alongside making your answer clear, you've got to be concise, which means that you don't want to spend too much time writing too much down. If you're writing too much stuff down, then it's taking you more time, which means you have less time for the other questions. But the thing is that uh, it does say here that all marks can be obtained within the answer space provided. So if you're finding that you're having to like use extra pages all the time, you're writing too much and you're not being clear and concise. When it comes to multiple choice questions, some exam papers do have these. What it's worth doing is rather than just looking at four choices and thinking about which is the correct one, as you go through the answers and you know that they're incorrect, maybe put a cross to the side. You know that then that's not going to be the correct answer. So then if you don't know the answer, it's not a one in four choice, it might be one in three or one in two. And as you do this, you should find that there's some definite wrong answers, and that means it's more likely you're going to get the right answer for that multiple choice question. Now you should always be reading the question and you need to make sure that you answer the question that they're asking. So for example, if it says give your answer to two significant figures, then give your answer to two significant figures like it says in the question. Sometimes this is even in bold text. And if it doesn't say how many significant figures to give your answer to, you should give it to the least amount of significant figures in the question. Generally, this is two or three significant figures. And as you're working through to make sure that you are answering the right question, there's nothing wrong with highlighting or underlining things in the question. You're not going to be marked on this, you're not going to be penalized for having highlighter, for circles around things, and maybe making your own notes to the side. Anything that you can do to give yourself a better chance of actually asking the, answering the question they're asking is only gonna help you in the long run. And you've got to remember as well that different parts of the question are linked. So there might be something from question A that you rely on in, in part B. It might be a, a calculated value that you've worked out. It might be guiding towards you uh, maybe a certain topic. So don't think that question B doesn't rely on question A. Sometimes if you're stuck on question B, you can't find the right data, you might have just calculated it earlier in the question. And it's always a good idea to make sure that you check the units and make conversions if needed. So for example, we should always be using the SI units, things like kilograms, meters, and seconds. So that means if they're giving you distances in kilometers or centimeters, if they're giving you time in hours, you always need to convert back into the SI units. And again, if you've got something uh, which is maybe given in, oh, that's wrong, isn't it? Just noticed that, they've made a mistake here. Basically, centimeters cubed, uh, to get it into cubic meters, that's completely wrong, okay? Ignore what it says in that graphic here, that's not been done by a scientist. Basically, uh, if you've been given something with one of these prefixes, you need to make sure that you convert it into the right unit and that just comes with practice. So it might be multiplying or dividing by a thousand, whatever it might be. Ignore what it says in that graphic there. Now, a lot of the time you might need to compare things. And what you need to do then is very, very clearly state the difference. So A is greater than that of B. 
okay? It might sound obvious, it might be really simple, but make sure that you have this nice, straightforward comparison in your answer. And I'm sure that your teachers must have mentioned this to you about always showing your working out. Now, it might be that you make a mistake early on and you do the rest of the question correctly. If you don't show your working out and you just uh, put down the wrong answer, you're going to get zero marks. If, however, it might be a three or four mark question, you might only lose one mark for that one mistake, but still get maybe three out of the four marks. Okay, people make mistakes, that's natural, and it's something that happens when you're under timed conditions, but always show your calculations, okay? It doesn't take long to do, and if you're not in your exam at the moment, you've got to get into the habit, okay? Write down the equation, put in the numbers, show your working out, and if that's your habit, then it's going to be something that you just do automatically. I still do it, and I'm, a, I'm pretty good at physics, but I still have to show my working out all the time so I don't make mistakes. Now, occasionally you get uh, stuff to do with some data and it might be drawing in a line of best fit. Now, a lot of people, um, they always use a straight line of best fit, but don't forget that a line of best fit can be curved as well. It's got to fit the data. This one here, beautiful straight line, but it's the incorrect answer. We can see there's this trend that the data has this kind of curved line. And the other thing is that you don't have to be an artist, okay? We're talking about science diagrams drawn in an exam. So although this might be a beautiful picture of a Bunsen burner, it's kind of irrelevant, okay? Keep it as simple as possible. If you're heating up uh, the bottom of something, then just put an arrow to show that there's some heat there, okay? Now it also talks about describing data. This is very much a practical skills kind of thing. And when you're describing data, so it might be graphs or tables, you, know, you need to think about the whole trend or pattern, not just single data points. So what we might be saying here is that as speed increases, uh, sorry, but as the time increases, the speed increases steadily. Okay, the word steadily is really important because it shows that there's this linear kind of a proportional relationship between the two things. Okay, so when you're describing data, give as much information as possible about what the whole trend is. It might be slowing down, it might be speeding up, but think about using your descriptive language when you're describing data. Now the next point came up two times. Okay, use bullet points. They are super important because it means that you write less and you organize your answers properly. Remember the people marking this, I don't want to see a massive chunk of text to continue onto another page. So use diagrams appropriately, okay? Just because there's not space for a diagram doesn't mean that you, can, you can't put it in uh, on the lines that you can answer your question on. So diagrams, you know, they show that you know what you're talking about. And if you do bullet points in a logical order, that really helps when it comes to maybe describing a method for a practical thing, giving a set of instructions, or just any lot of these kind of even five or six mark questions, okay? Bullet points are really good. Examiners like them, the people marking your papers like them, so just get into those good habits. And that will mean then that you write less, you can do more of the paper in a certain amount of time, and you're not gonna run out of time in your exam. And this is probably one of the most important things in this video, okay? What you need to do is you need to, at some point, practice applying what you know to new situations. Now, any practical experiments that you've done over the last couple of years while doing your GCSE, they could be asked about. But it's also about using common lab equipment. So we're talking about thermometers and beakers and measuring cylinders, okay? Normal standard equipment that might be used in a slightly different way. So you will get asked about an unfamiliar experiment. That's absolutely fine, because it's not asking you to know about that experiment. It's to know about the apparatus and some of the techniques that you can use when you actually use that equipment. That's what the question is asking you about. So if you get something really unfamiliar, don't panic. It, you'll be absolutely fine. Just rely on all the practical work and the kind of skills that you've picked up for the last few years. And when it comes to writing about practical things, you've got to think about a risk assessment and some of the hazards. So don't just say, wear safety goggles, explain why you need to wear safety goggles. Maybe it's to stop acid splashing into your eye, which could then cause damage. It might be you're using some uh, gloves to insulate your hands because the apparatus is hot and that will stop you burning. So don't just say, wear safety glasses, say what they're preventing and why that's reducing the risk to a person. So that's some kind of generic advice about exam papers and also some of the practical skills. Now let's have a look at some of the topics. So why is it that the national grid uses step up and step down transformers? What they do is a step up transformer, what it does is it uh, increases the potential difference or the voltage in the national grid. Now when the potential difference goes up, the current goes down. And that's really important because when you have a smaller current, you reduce energy losses. The reason for this 
is that the power losses are equal to I squared R in those cables. If you reduce the current by a thousand times, you reduce the power losses by a million times. Okay, so that's why the national grid uses step up and step down transformers. The next one is a physics topic and it's about energy stores and transfers. Okay, energy can be stored in different places like the chemical store, the thermal store, the kinetic store, gravitational potential store and so on. There are not different types of energy and this is something that has been a massive issue across exam boards where some teachers are still teaching it in the old style. So you don't have a type of energy, you don't have kinetic energy which turns into a different type of energy called gravitational potential energy. All it is that this energy is stored in different stores. So when it comes to answers, remember the energy stores and also the different energy transfers. Again, I've got videos at GCSE Physics Online about all of this. Now, I guess this is chemistry, but it's also physics, okay? An isotope has the same number of protons in the nucleus, but a different number of neutrons, okay? You need to learn that definition. And if you've got uh, carbon, it's carbon because it's got six protons. So these things are both carbon, but this one has an extra neutron, so that's also known as carbon-13, and we have things like carbon-14 and so on. So isotopes have a different mass, so they've got a different amount of things in the nucleus, but the same number of protons, and therefore the same number of electrons, so chemically they behave in the same way. Uh, pretty straightforward, this one. If you're going to draw a circuit, use the correct symbols and make sure that all the components are connected. So don't leave gaps, okay? Also, you've got to remember that an ammeter goes in series. If you had a voltmeter, a voltmeter would go in parallel across a component, and I'm just going to make sure I do that up. You don't need to use a ruler necessarily to draw your circuit diagrams, but you do need to make sure that everything is connected up. Now going back to one of my earlier points about you don't need to write everything uh, in massive long sentences, sometimes you can actually use the equation instead. So rather than saying that force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, if you put down F equals MA, that makes just as much sense. Because the people who are going to be marking your papers, they know the science and they know that F equals MA, they know what all of these things stand for. So what this can do is it means that your answers are concise, it's quicker to write down, and often they're clearer, okay? So sometimes equations can really help your answer. Alongside that, it's also nice to have diagrams. So a free body diagram is a way of showing the forces acting on an object. Perhaps we've got an apple, which is sitting on a table, pretty standard. You might have the weight acting down, and you might have the normal contact force acting upwards, and that's uh, from the table pushing back up. Now, again, you probably should write, you should write these and actually write out what this stands for, run just W, but this is a free body diagram. That's the object, these are the forces. We don't need a kind of pretty colored in picture of an apple because that doesn't really add anything to our explanation, okay? So keep it simple, keep it quick, and you're gonna get the right answer. Okay, a little bit of chemistry, but outside my comfort zone, bearing in mind this is all about physics, but I thought I'd put these in, because you're going to be, you need, you need to know this anyway, don't you? So, um, you can't, lots of people couldn't remember the chemical test for ions in solution. I must admit, I can't remember it now, because I haven't revised chemistry for several years, I haven't taught it for a long time. So, um, make sure that certain things like this you can remember, that's just a simple fact. Also, when it comes to your diagrams, be clear about whether the attraction between, is between the molecules, like the whole water molecule is attracting another water molecule, or if it's between maybe some of the atoms within that. So maybe it's the hydrogen being attracted to the oxygen over there. Now the next thing you need to do is that you need to make sure that you know the names of different uh, organic things. Okay, so it might be you've got your methane, ethane, propane, and so on. You've got your anes and enes, okay? You need to know what both of these are, um, both in terms of how to draw the diagrams nice and clearly, and also what they're actually called. And also, when it comes to looking at ionic compounds, you've got to make sure that you have an idea about how many maybe oxygen uh, to magnesium ions there might be. And that's because you should work out where these are on the periodic table. You should know if they're one plus or two minus, whatever it might be. So make sure that you balance the charges in ionic formulas. And also, when it comes to balancing things, make sure that you do balance your equations properly, okay? This is a key skill that you'll have started maybe in year nine or year 10. So just have a final check. The top one, we've got one magnesium, two oxygens, but one magnesium and one oxygen. This one here can't be balanced, and we know that what's on the left is on the right as well. Another thing about knowledge, okay, is just uh, the names of cell types and the structure of organs. 
Okay, so this is the thing where you need to make sure that you recognize the diagrams. When it comes to revising, make sure you've maybe kind of just drawn a quick sketch diagram to show the different sorts of cells and roughly what they look like. Also, when it comes to things like inheritance, practice Punnett squares, and also calculating the probability of genetic diseases. Remember that there's a lot more mathematics now in things like the biology than chemistry than there has been in some of the previous older specification past papers. So make sure that you know some of these things. Again, this is just factual knowledge that you can uh, recall. Okay, so practice using these squares. And also, um, think about these graphs here. Look at this image, try and remember this. Well, if you're looking at pho photosynthesis, look at the effect of carbon dioxide, light intensity, and also temperature, where I guess temperature is the odd one out, where it gets too hot and things stop happening. And also, finally, look at the function of guard cells and stomata. Yes, it's very unlikely this exact question is going to come up, but it's the kind of thing that has come up before, and therefore they realise there's a gap in people's knowledge, so they're going to be asking this at some point in the near future. So, thanks for watching. That has been my uh, sort of look at the OCR papers in particular, but I'd say about 70% of that stuff I've talked about, about using bullet points, about showing you're working out, can be applied to everybody, okay? Super, super important skills. I really hope that uh, helps you kind of maybe get a few extra marks, maybe go up a grade or two in your exams, which are coming up very soon. In the meantime, if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to this channel on YouTube and also have a look at GCSEphysicsonline.com as well as alevelphysicsonline.com where I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more videos made for people like you doing your science exams at the moment. Thanks for watching.